Hey everyone, this is Alexis Hutchinson from the FY Talks podcast. We're here today um, with a very special guest from a very special program, and I'm going to let him introduce himself now. Hi, uh, my name is Troy Stevenson. I'm the National Campaign Director for the Trevor Project's uh, campaign to end conversion therapy around the nation. So the Trevor Project is the world's largest LGBTQ youth suicide prevention organization. So we um, we work across the country and also in some work in Canada and other countries about uh, ending suicide uh, amongst LGBT youth and, and obviously for everybody else as well, but that's our, mm -hmm. our primary focus. So um, we have 24 hour crisis lines, which do uh, talk, text and chat for, um, for youth under 25. Um, and then we have something called Trevor Space, which most people listening are probably not old enough to remember MySpace, but it was named uh, similar to that back in the day. So it's similar to Facebook or other social media platforms where young people can connect with each other. Um, it is limited to under 25, so they they only speak to their own um, cohorts, and and so it's the safety aspect there. But the uh, text that is around the world, the Trevor Space, the the text uh, talk and chat options are for our crisis services are just based in the United States at this point, but gotcha. um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're talking to youth. My, I work in the advocacy program. So we, uh, what we do is go around the country. We work at the federal, the state and the municipal level, as well as some work in Canada to um, promote and pass legislation and ordinances that are aimed at protecting young people from conversion therapy. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into what conversion therapy is here. here in a I was going to say that would be my next question. Right. You know, for those who, who are familiar what that is and what that entails, can you give a little bit of insight onto what is conversion therapy? Sure. Um, conversion therapy is medically and scientifically called um, sexual orientation and gender identity change efforts. So which is a, a, a mouthful of name, but what it is, is an attempt by um, by people that are working outside the parameters of, of mental health best practices to attempt to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. So they, um, and theoretically this could be done to anybody, but the, but the primary focus is um, there are people who try to turn gay kids straight, trans kids, cisgender. I mean, they, it's a, the, the, majority of it is is something called talk therapy where they they tell the young person or the adult or whoever they're doing this to that there's something wrong with who they intrinsically are so um all the best medical science uh the best practices of the mental health professions all the major associations and when i say all i mean every major association that's accredited has come out against conversion therapy as an abusive practice that, that harms young people so um, it's our efforts are mainly aimed at stopping licensed practitioners from doing this because that's what we can do within the law. A lot of it is also done with unlicensed folks who are either doing it through something called pastoral care or, or other means that aren't licensed by the practice that they're claiming it to be, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Absolutely. And so is there any real action that can be taken to kind of address that level that's kind of without or outside of the reach of the law? I mean, I see that that's still, you know, probably prevalent in communities around Kentucky. Is there anything that can be done, raising awareness, things like that? Public education. So public education is the most important piece. In other countries, there is more flexibility to, to do things where you're telling adults what they can and cannot do to themselves, but we don't we have a lot of freedom to do a lot of things that hurt us in this country. And, and I'm, I think we're all happy about that, but it's also uh, important that we, um, we let people know that what they're doing can hurt themselves or that what is being done to them can hurt them. So a lot of our efforts are also based around making sure that people A, know this still exists and B, letting parents, especially parents know that this is harmful because I think there's a, there's a misconception that parents go out and they want to hurt their kids because they're gay or they want to hurt their kids because they're trans. And that's very, very, very seldom the case. I mean, I'm not going to say it never happens because somebody would probably come up and tell me, well, this one parent wanted to hurt their kid, but that's mm -hmm. what we find most often is they don't know that this is harmful. 
because mm -hmm. they're being sold a bill of goods. It's like snake oil. They Somebody is telling them that, that their kid can be hurt and many parents are seeing, you know, they see the vitriol aimed at, at, at gay folks around the country and around the world. And, and their natural inclination is I don't want my kid to have to face all of this. So, uh, and there are parents that are very hateful, obviously, but that's not, that's not, mm -hmm. The majority so what we try to do is let them know the harms that are involved to mm -hmm. let them hear from those that have survived conversion therapy and from former conversion therapists that have come out and, and said that it doesn't work they themselves were gay um and they spent a lifetime trying to to change that and it couldn't so going back i've been doing this work for about a decade and the first bans on conversion therapy happened in 2012 and 2013 in california and new jersey gotcha. um, at that time and still today we we talked to many people that say this can't still be happening this this it didn't this end in the 1970s is what i don't know why they've pegged the 1970s as the time that this ended but that's <laughs> what we hear from the so general much. consensus <laughs> right um but so yeah, letting pe just making sure that people know it's happening, mm -hmm. bringing shining sunlight on on such a dark practice is what is what we try to do. So I think what you're doing here, just explaining that this is this is a thing that still happens. This is something that people need to be aware of, watch for, and let parents know that that this will hurt their 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 young people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's absolutely what we're trying to do is raise awareness on um, a lot of these issues that just like you said, they fly under the radar somehow, because if you know you and your community aren't really dealing with it or haven't experienced some form of that, it can be something that you think, you know, oh, that's already ended. That doesn't affect, you know, where I'm at. And it very much could. And right. so um, what are some of the real harms that conversion therapy does to young people? What are the ways that it impacts them, you know, even later on in their lives when they're in their, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever the case may be? Um, actually, that's when a lot of the harms become apparent. Um, it's, it's, I mean, there are physical forms of this which can cause immediate harm. Mm -hmm. um, things like forced exorcism, forced, I don't know who decides they want to have some sort of exorcism done against them. So I don't, I don't think that's a thing either. <laughs> I don't think they're choosing that, but, but it, um, those are the outliers. Most of it is the psychological and emotional harm that happens. So um, we've, and I can send you uh, Trevor Project's research. We just had a, a new national mental health survey for young people. Um, suicidality amongst LGBTQ youth is so much higher uh, 42%, I believe, is, is the number. Goodness. Um, higher than it is amongst um, amongst their straight and cisgender contemporaries. Um, it's the number of, of, let's see, 10%, I believe, is the number that came out in our, our last survey of, of young people that have LGBTQ youth who have um, experienced some form of conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. And when you take it to anybody that's ever tried to change their sexual orientation in a, in a less formal way, whether that's a parent or a teacher or a grandparent, um, it goes up to two thirds. Uh, the harms involved are, are long-term and vast. You can listen to survivors tell stories of, of, of just horrific post-traumatic stress disorder and, 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 Mainly, it's the the immediate jump to suicidality. The numbers are just exponentially higher mm -hmm. for people that have been through this. Um, and for those that, that don't quite understand why that would be the case, imagine telling, being told that something so intrinsic to who you are is wrong and being told that if you don't change this inborn aspect of yourself, that you will never be loved and you will never fit into society. Mm -hmm. That this is drilled into their minds, and and they spend their lifetime trying to um, to overcome it. And mm -hmm. and it's not just those that it's not just those that are directly impacted by it, but it's those around them. Um, I, for example, when I was a teenager, when I was um, in high school, my, I had my first boyfriend, and we were behind the school holding hands. Um, the football team came running out and we got chased away and we went each went to our individual homes and I was on the phone with them. This is back in the late nineties when you still picked up phones yeah. um, instead of, but, um, 
he just kept saying he couldn't go back. He was inconsolable and in tears. And I thought he meant to school and it was just strange because, you know, that it was not, I didn't think we were in danger at school. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, this is not the, th the thought process I was going through. And he went to a school across town. So it wasn't, it was even less likely that that was what he was scared of. So he finally told me that he couldn't go back and he, he couldn't go back to a place that his parents had sent him. And it was, at the time, I didn't have the language to understand exactly what he was talking about, but it was, it was conversion therapy. He took his life that night and oh I never saw him again, obviously, but um, that's, that's the level of harm it can do. So, I mean, I've dealt with, with years and years and years of, of therapy to get over that. And now just imagine the person it was actually done to, as opposed to the person that was adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. um, you just, especially at that young of an age, messing with somebody's emotions in their, in their psyche is, is tragic. Well, I can't imagine, you know, like you said, being, you know, a teenager at a time where you're already vulnerable because you're already not sure where your life is going, who you are as a person, what you really feel is true. And then you've got all of these, you know, mistruths being forced at you and then, you know, having to deal with, you know, am I bad as a person? You know, how can you, because that's something I don't think people understand that when they hear that, that is being told to them in a way that it is insurmountable. You know, right. you are a bad person and you need to change something you have absolutely no control over. That has got to be just the most hopeless feeling that you can imagine, you know? And so I think it's wonderful that you're spreading light on the real damage that this does, you know? And like you were saying, it manifests, you know, sometimes 20, 30 years later, as an adult. And so do you see a lot of older adults, you know, coming and speaking about their experiences and wanting to spread awareness? As um, over the last decade, more and more young people have begun to speak, but for the longest time, it was folks that had already been through some sort of affirming therapy to be able to put themselves. And I think that's an important point. Yes, we do see many, many people. I, it used to be people in their 30s and 40s. I mean, we, people in their 50s and 60s have talked about it, but now it's it's getting to where you are talking to more people that are in their, their 20s, that are closer to the source of the pain. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's important that we also don't, we attempt to not um, sensationalize or put those stories out too quickly because having mental health support is vital when somebody is going to talk about that type of, of, of thing. And so we, we don't suggest that, that young people who are not, once again, they're not, if they're going through this, they're not supported immediately go out and talk about their experience without having that safety net, that Definitely. safe space, that, that therapist or, or pastor or teacher or professor or whoever is there to, to back them up and to make sure that they're in a safe space to be able to share these things. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. And so we've kind of talked about conversion therapy and how that really you know, traumatizes people from a young age when they're exposed to this. And so um, as far as Kentucky, and I've got some notes here, mm -hmm. it's only two cities in Kentucky, Covington and Louisville have banned conversion therapy. Yes. Do you know or have any updates? I believe there was a bill that was being put forth to ban it um, across the state of Kentucky. Do you have any information about that? Yeah, we are working closely with two organizations in Kentucky. One is the Fairness Campaign, mm -hmm. um, which is your statewide LGBTQ um, advocacy organization. And the other one is called Ban Conversion Therapy Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, which is actually run by a former intern of mine who's doing amazing work across the Fantastic. Kentucky. So, and uh, Chris Hartman, who runs the Fairness Campaign, is, a, is an old dear friend. So I have a, an affinity in my heart for, for Kentucky because of such amazing people that I know doing great work. But um, I was actually in Kentucky last year, early this year, might have been January. This whole COVID thing has made me mush oh, yeah, up where everything is in my brain. Um, but we were there for the Fairness Campaign's rally um, that they do every year at the Capitol and the governor Bashir spoke and, um, and I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on his name. The gentleman that was in the primary against McGrath for, um, for us Senate. Are you at Mitch McConnell? No, no, no. Or, the, no. the Democrat that was running right. against her. Um, I, know. Anyway. I thought about that and just, what is his name? Troy Booker? 
Okay. No, see, yeah, yeah, if you're on, that's something like this. Yeah. He spoke as well, um, and there were there was just a litany of, of of lawmakers, and there were a couple of hundred people, maybe three hundred people in the the um, the atrium there in the Capitol, and it was it was an amazing thing to see. I've done I've been to probably forty of the fifty states so far advocating for this, and that was the most energy I've seen in a state capitol around I mean around this issue and it was yeah I think there's a lot of momentum in Kentucky I don't want to give some sort of false sense of hope that it can happen immediately but there's a lot of progress well you and, do see uh, a lot of support it seems oh yeah there's a lot of support there was a, there are a lot of lawmakers uh your your governor gave a, a very impassioned speech on the on the subject um there's also the in the smaller places in in well Louisville's not that small but the Louisville City Council or County Council, I believe it is, mm -hmm. um, just passed their their ordinance ending conversion therapy twenty four to one, as you mentioned. I mean that's that is huge progress that you don't see in in a lot of more quote unquote liberal cities around the country. I mean it wow. was virtually unanimous. There was one contrarian lawmaker. I'm not sure that he he gave a speech. I'm not sure where that came from, but it was mm -hmm. it was um, overall it was just overwhelmingly supportive. At the, at the Louisville hearing, uh, Covington was another one that went that went quickly. So, I know that both the Fairness Campaign and Ban Conversion Therapy Kentucky are working with other municipalities around the state and are hoping for movement um, this year on on the bill that would be statewide. They had a really good some it's a interim study, a study during the off session where lawmakers had a uh, conversation about conversion therapy at the Capitol, which went well. So, Fantastic. There's lots of great things happening in Kentucky. And, and, and if your students are at all interested, I would suggest looking into one of those organizations and or both of them. Absolutely. I think that the more that we can show how you can be an advocate, how you can further, you know, if this is an issue that you feel impassioned about, then here are ways that you can connect yourself to these resources. And so the Fairness Campaign, Band Conversion Therapy in Kentucky, I would encourage anyone to seek out information about their organizations um, if you're interested in continuing and supporting those um, plights. And so with that, you kind of hit on this earlier when you were describing your project, but um, the Trevor Project was working on like a 911 type of line. And so is that in, is that how that is now or is it still in the works? Um, I mean, you mentioned that you could contact that line. Um, yes, absolutely. We, you can contact the Trevor Project through, it's a, it's a seven digit number that I, I don't have memorized and I should, but it's, if you go to the trevorproject.org, um, it will, it will lead you there. But 988 is what you're talking about. It's a, it's a designated suicide prevention hotline that will be national. Mm -hmm. um, we've worked on this for a couple of years with a lot of amazing advocates from around the country. But it was one of our biggest success pieces that, that obviously has, it, it didn't get a lot of attention when it, it did pass. It passed unanimously through the US Senate and the US House of Representatives um, and is waiting on a signature from the president right now. So this would, um, this bill would, or this law now would create, will create, I'm, I'm, it's so recent that it passed. I'm still using the Absolutely. wrong language. It will create um, 988, which is a three digit hotline that will be exactly like 911 where folks can call for mental health support, especially suicide prevention. It's, it's a suicide designation. So, um, and it won't be in place for, so nobody call 988 is what I'm telling you right now and for two years because it's these things, unfortunately, with something as cumbersome as a, a national uh, government hotline is going to take a hot minute to, to put together. So two years is the expectation for that. And now we break for a program plug. Hi, my name is Linda Smiley, and I am the IHOPE therapist at Communicare at the Elizabethtown Clinic. The position that I have there as the therapist is I work with individuals that are ages 15 to 30. Um, they have a first episode of psychosis. And what that means is if um, a young person between the ages of 15 and 30 start to have paranoid or anxious sim symptoms in a familiar setting, or if they're having unusual thoughts, feelings, and um, knowing that they feel different than normal, uh, having trouble focusing on a task, 
uh, not wanting to spend time with friends and family, which that would be unusual, um, hearing or seeing things that are not there. That is pretty much what a first episode of psychosis is, especially when that person is a younger person, ages of 15 to 30. Um, the services that we provide with the I Hope program, we have a full-time therapist, which is myself, and we also have case management um, that they are able to link the individual to community resources outside of the agency as well as within the agency. We have medical providers if the individual would like to be on medication. Um, medication is not required for them to be in the program. Uh, some young people don't want to take medicine because that makes them feel um, not normal. They want to feel like their peers. Um, we also have a nurse that we um, have that's, that can give injections if needed. We have a peer support person. Um, a peer support person is a person that has lived experience, and they're able to assist that person with their own personal story. Um, we also have supported employment, and that supported employment person works with vocational rehab, and the services through vocational rehab, there are educational tracks, and then there's an employment track. So they are able to choose which track that they want to go uh, for. So um, that is pretty much the um, gist of our program. Uh, if you would like to make a referral, you could contact me at 270-734-2202, and uh, we would love to be able to meet, you know, the individuals that you refer and get them started. So that's Thank you. It's a, it's, it, it's also a sign that our nation in, in this, this heated, polarized, partisan environment can still do something really good to, to help mm -hmm. with something so important. And prioritizing mental health in the same way we do physical health is something that, that has long overdue. Mm -hmm. Well, I was gonna say, do you see good progress being made to kind of bridge that gap between, you know, physical health awareness, you see, you know, get fit campaigns all the time and keeping people moving and things like that. But on the mental health side, are you seeing a lot of progress towards really tangible quality resources for people who are suffering from a mental illness or need that extra support? I don't think there will ever be enough, but yes, I think, um, I think that, I think people are, seeing the intersection of physical health and mental health in, in much better ways. I think that we are, the stigmatization of mental health is, is starting to to wane. I think it's not, um, so the answer is yes. I think I do see progress. It's, we could have two hours of conversation around where that is, but I think, um, I think there's a lot more to do. I think it's in some ways sad that we, that it, it's 2020 and we've just now come up with a, a distinct line for, for suicide prevention, which you would think would be obvious. But I think it all feeds into our ever-changing ways of thinking about everything, talking about whether or not, I mean, with 988, it would be the difference in the police coming to somebody's house for a call, as opposed to, in this case, you've got mental health professionals who are actually guiding what's going on, as opposed mm -hmm. to calling 911. Um, and especially speaking to folks in Kentucky, we've all seen what happens when, when you get the wrong, the wrong folks at the wrong door at the wrong time of night. So mm -hmm. I think it is very important that, that we do look at health in general and mental health, especially as things outside of, um, I'm, I'm being very careful in how I'm saying this, if you haven't <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Yes, I think we have to prioritize it in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we are, and I think we're seeing it, but I hope that lawmakers in Kentucky and around the country think about how to, to create that greater space that, that people can be physically and emotionally safe while reaching out for emotional support. Definitely. Because I mean, sometimes you only get that one chance to really make an impact in someone's life, you know, to tell them that there is this chance that they can have a better life, a better quality of life. And so definitely that's really exciting to hear that that's going to be in place. And like you said, it's not up right now. We don't no. want to be calling 98 right now, but right. it's on it's on its way. And so that's really good. And like you two said, years, two years, once again, is the expectation. So yes. 
that gives a lot of hope as far as what this administration is doing to kind of put forth a lot of awareness and a lot of help to bridge that gap. Because I think, you know, just from social media and kind of being around younger people in my position, you see a lot of people having those discussions. You see a lot of people wanting resources that, you know, I can remember when we were younger, I mean, we had a resource counselor, you know, and that was just, you know, did your shoelaces bust on your shoe and you need a new shoe? There was not anyone who really said like, are you okay? Do you feel supported? Do you feel like, you know, you're okay, I guess. Right. That really didn't pick up until, you know, now really that I'm seeing it in high schools where there is this emphasis on mental health and creating safe spaces for LGBTQ students. You know, when I was in high school, not that long ago, that didn't exist. You know, that wasn't talked about. It just did not exist. I mean, there might've been resources that were a flyer on the wall, but as far as real tangible, you can come and talk to me. You can do this. Here is a safe space, a room you can go to people who will advocate for you on your behalf. If, People are, you know, making you feel uncomfortable. I really only saw that recently. And so that is really exciting um, to kind of segue into something. And of course, we don't want to get too political on this, but um, how do you see this new administration, whichever way it goes, affecting your organization? And, you know, are you, what, are hope, what are some hopes you have for the future of this organization moving forward? Um, uh, sure. Um... We have got plans no matter what. It doesn't matter who's elected president. We're a, a, we're a nonprofit organization that, that doesn't delve into the realm of politics. Um, I mean, we, people want to say we, we get into politics, but we, we advocate for policy, not, not politics. And, and that's, there's a big difference there. So uh, no matter who's in the administration, we will, um, we will be moving forward to protect young lives. But um, and it, it just, I mean, obviously there are some things that if there were a Joe Biden administration, we would be able to pass some, some laws that are a little bit different than what we can under a Trump administration, but, mm-hmm. but it's our job as advocates to work around whatever we're, we're given. So, um, that said, we, we will continue to do, to be there 24 hours a day for young people. Um, we, in some cases, what happens in, in the realm of politics, we like to avoid talking about because it does have those upticks in suicidality, depending on, especially in this polarized world where everybody is, um, everybody is, what is the best way to put this? It's, it, there's just a level of vitriol from, that's everywhere. And it, it's at a boiling point. And, and I'm not putting partisan anything on it. It's, I think social media has made us mean in general. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's um, it's we're gonna keep going no matter what, and it will not affect it will not affect our direct advocacy except in making it easier in some places and harder in others, and that's that's how elections work. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I think I lost track of the com- of the question at some point. Well, um, fine. Um, do you, what are some of those things moving forward with your organization that you're really excited about? Obviously, like we said, we've got the 988. Is there anything else that you're really, you know, pumped to share and to let people know is coming down the pipeline? The implementation of 988 over the next two years is gonna is gonna be vital. We're really excited about that. Um, we're also we have started a and you mentioned it with Louisville and Covington. We have. On the conversion therapy front, we have um, got a new sub campaign within our campaign called Protecting with Pride. And what we're doing is, is there are, and getting into the political slightly again, there are, um, there are places in the country where it's easier to pass uh, pro-queer legislation. We've passed this ban in most of those places. So we're now working in places that are quote unquote harder because they've got a different makeup of, of lawmakers and a different different opinions and, and places where less public education have been done in the past. So um, we're working on, on just like in Louisville and just like in Covington in passing ordinances at municipalities aimed at protecting young people in those cities, municipalities or cities and towns. I know you know that, but some people might not. Listen. Some people might not. Um, but um, to a add those protections at that that city level, and to b spread that public education of this is still happening, this is wrong, and this is what it does to your kids. So, 
So moving into that public education space while working on advocating for laws and ordinances um, is, is always fun. And, and so that's our aim with this new campaign is to get into not just the, the New York cities and the Los Angeleses or the Louisvilles of the world, but also getting into the small municipalities, um, the even in even smaller cities like Lexington, um, where where this work can be done, but people are not are not paying as much attention yet. Um, so that's we are excited to help local and statewide organizations navigate those paths. Definitely. And so, what just to kind of give people some context on it? What are some of the major kickbacks that you see? for people who advocate for conversion therapy? What are some of the roadblocks that people try and use to say, no, this needs to stay? You know, what is their argument almost? Um, well, I hate to make the argument for the other side, but I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm kidding, people I'm, I'm joking. know why people would advocate on behalf right. of this. When it, to a lot of people, it seems so obviously damaging. Right. There are, there are folks that, um, believe parental rights are more important than the rights of the child. They believe that the, the parent that should absolutely be able to do anything as long as their child is a minor. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that even they think there are limits to that, but it, it is, the argument is that we're stepping into the lane of parents. Um, we, but what they're forgetting is we step into the lane of parents and doctors all the time. Mm -hmm. um, when a medical practice is deemed to be harmful, it's stopped. In every other form of, in every other regulatory form, um, you can't, doctors and therapists and parents can't do anything they want. Mm -hmm. um, this is one where that's because of the stigma surrounding the queer community that still exists, they still think it's okay to do this. Um, and it is an odd argument that we've, we've, consistently push back on, but it consistently comes back. What about the rights of parents? Well, parents don't have the rights to abuse their children. I mean, that's just, I mean, it's that simple, but it's still, yeah, it, but it's that, that is still the argument we're, we're facing. Um, there are also um, fringe groups out there that are trying to claim that this is an effective practice. I mean, that's been disproven time and time again, but um, in this world we live in, getting back to the 24 hour news cycle and social media, everybody seems to think both sides deserve um, to tell their story, even if one side is just completely nuts, mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better term. I mean, yeah, these are not equal arguments. <laughs> right. Goodness. And so I'm, I think that gives some valuable context as far as, you know, with people thinking, I feel like you're in two camps, you're either for it or you think it doesn't exist in a lot of ways, you know, and then obviously there are many, many people who recognize that it exists and that it is harmful and things like that. But I mean, like you said, it just seems to come back to education and the effects and things like that. And so if people were wanting to educate themselves, if people were wanting to, you know, take notice of this issue and then help spread that awareness, what are some effective ways that they can spread this knowledge um, to people who might not be aware? Um, I would, once again, I would suggest they get in touch with the Fairness Campaign or Band Conversion Therapy Kentucky, mm -hmm. or they can go to the trevorproject.org and sign up with in, at our 50 Bills 50 States campaign on the website, and we can share information with them. And I know that Fairness and Band, and, uh, Band Conversion Therapy Kentucky, which is a, a mouthful, mm -hmm. um, will do the same. They can also reach out to, depending on where they live, they can they can reach out to their city council members and, and talk to them or their county commissioners or um, their state lawmaker and, and show support. They can go to the Fairness Campaign's annual, um, and I believe that's in January, so it's coming up, the um, rally at the Capitol that they have every year. Okay. Um, and well, I wouldn't suggest going to a rally right now in COVID, but, um, <laughs> but however that pans out with the right. people, but. but to get involved, to get involved with a, an organization, go to, and if it's the, the young people doing that, they can also get their parents involved in PFLAG, um, which PFLAG chapters are all over Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, just going out and sometimes getting out from behind the keyboard and going out into the real world and, and talking to real people about real things. Uh, I think is, and that sounds simple and cliche, but it's something that I don't even do enough of these days. I sit here and look at Zoom calls all day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but um, 
but yeah, just make their voices heard, be an active part of the community and use those advocates in the state and around the country that that are, are in need of that kind of volunteer support and, and, and that just step into those spaces and stay in those spaces. I think the most important part is stay in those spaces. It can be intimidating. Mm -hmm. Don't go once or don't call once or don't do one action and think that that's either enough or that that's too intimidating to do again. Stick with it mm -hmm. because it's, it's the, their rights and it's the rights of their family and their friends and their community that, that they're advocating for. And you just have to keep showing up. Definitely. And so I think a lot of people are intimidated because they feel like they're going to get a lot of kickback. Like we said, there's a lot of vitriol going around right now with organizations and things like that. And on both sides, you can make an argument that both sides are really hammering away at their um, own thoughts, feelings, things like that. And that is what it is. But I think the most important thing to kind of reiterate is just you're going to find a support network. You know, there are going to be people there willing to, you know, stand up with you, talk with you, you know, believe in you. And that's a huge thing, you know, and it sounds like, you know, the Trevor Project is really about bringing people together for awareness and advocacy. And I just love that. I think that that's going to be super effective moving forward. I think so, too. I hope so. And that's what, yeah, we, um, it's our pillars, public education, and advocacy, education. We do a lot of research, so making sure that people have the tools to to change the world that's our goal definitely and so can they access the research that your organization has done on your website absolutely it's the trevorproject.org and if if any of them are in crisis or need to um to talk to somebody the phone number is 866-488-7386 that's 866-488-7386 they can also go to the trevorproject.org and all of this uh, research and information is in there. Um, and probably the easiest way is just, just Google um, Trevor Project Mental Health Survey 2020 mm -hmm. and that'll come up with our, our mental health survey and, and they can and they can Google 2019. It's good information there too, but, mm -hmm. but they're actually a little bit different. The two reports are a little bit different because some questions were asked differently. So it is, it's, it's good to look at all of it, but um, it's, it's insightful and our research department just does an amazing job. Uh, other than the Williams Institute at UCLA in, in California, it's probably the most comprehensive uh, research on queer youth that's out there. That's fantastic. And so just kind of as a closer, wrapping it up a little bit, if you could give, you know, a word, piece of advice, a little kernel of wisdom, you know, to either parents who are struggling with this decision, students who are struggling, who have maybe gone through this or have been affected by this in some capacity, mm -hmm. what is kind of your, your mantra, your motto that you would give to them to kind of be like, it's going to be okay? Um, I mean, it's, it sounds really simple and it's, i a few years ago, this was the, the catchphrase going around, but it, it will get better. And it, I think the, the campaign then, the, I think it was no hate. <clears throat> it was, it, it gets better. Well, it doesn't just get better. You have to make it better, but, but surround yourself with community. And, and like I said, stick with it um, and, and keep showing up, showing up for your friends and your family and your, your, your colleagues and your schoolmates and your classmates and, and the people that need it, and you never know when a kind word, one kind word, could could change somebody's day or their life. Very true. Um, and being kind to people, I it's something simple that I like to keep in mind every time I go through a toll booth or I go to the airport to to park. It's <clears throat> that that person in that toll booth is alone all day long for eight hours a day, and. They're usually dealing with cranky people that are in a hurry that are probably not saying the nicest things to them. And if you just take that 10 seconds to say, how are you? How's your day? And thank you. Um, it, it could really bring them out of a, of a bad place quickly. And, and I'm not just saying go to a bunch of toll booths and be nice to people. <laughs> I'm saying that, but use that as, as a way of, of living is instead of thinking about the thing that's on your mind right now, think about how, what your words are that are about to come out of your mouth or going to how they're going to affect that other person. And that is not a kernel. That's a whole, I gave you a, a whole like, yeah. corn oh, popcorn. popcorn. <laughs> but Still. Be, be nice to people. I think be nice is something we don't say enough. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, we look now and like you said, with this environment, things like that, you can't have enough kindness. And, you know, I can't think of a single person who wouldn't appreciate hearing a kind word, you know, more than they hear now. So I definitely agree. I've got a, a friend, he's a judge now, but he, he taught me when I was young, he's a mentor of mine, that he said, you know, we can be as academic as we want. We can have all the degrees and all the power in the world, but but the simplest thing that people need to know is don't be mean to other people because the, True. you use, I mean, it, what it boils right down to it is mean. People are mean mm -hmm. and, and that's not, be the opposite of mean is whatever, whatever your opposite is. Be an anti-mean. Right. <laughs> Advocate for the niceness. Right. And I completely agree. And so thank you so much for joining us today. This has been super insightful. And I think that a lot of people in our community are really going to be interested by this um, discussion and hopefully participate in that advocacy and that awareness we've talked about. Um, is there anything you'd like to say on closing or any information? Oh, no, I think I just gave you a whole, a whole lot of clothes. <laughs> gotcha. All right. So again, thank you so thank much. You. All right. Take care.